Well, let's turn in our Bibles over to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 over in the New Testament. Uh, one of the prison epistles that the Apostle Paul wrote around A.D. 60 or so. Colossians chapter 1. There's a story of a little girl who was at home one Saturday morning, and uh, she was coloring at the kitchen table, about four years old, just mm -hmm, mm, coloring away and having a, a great time. And she was humming a song and scribbling on her paper, and her dad walked by and noticed her ongoing work that she was doing there at the table. And he said, well, hi, honey, what are you drawing? She said, I'm drawing a picture of God. Daddy? He said, well, honey, no one knows what God looks like. And she said, well, they will when I get through. <laughs> and uh, you know what, folks? A lot of adults have that idea. Well, you know, people will know what God looks like when I get through. The problem is what God looks like and, and, uh, and what he's like has already been given to us. It's in the Bible. We don't have to create our own version of God or Jesus, which is what people are doing today. We can believe what God says about him. And not only can we believe it, folks, it's imperative that we believe it. Who Jesus Christ really is. Do we really understand who Jesus Christ is? Now, there's been much debate down through the ages on the person of Jesus Christ. Even many religious groups differ on who he is. Let me say that who, he, who Jesus Christ is will sooner or later have a major impact on every person who has ever lived or ever will live. You might say, I don't understand how that relates. Well, stay tuned, all right? Because we are going to look at this truth. This is one of the major reasons why the letter to the Colossians was written, was to define or explain who Jesus Christ is. There were those who were teaching false doctrine concerning the person of Jesus Christ, and as we go through this passage today, we are going to clearly see why Jesus Christ should have the preeminence above all. Okay, the Bible gives us many truths about Jesus Christ. Now, the theme of Colossians, as we have seen, is the preeminence of Christ. What does that mean, preeminence? It means first place, above all. Something has the preeminence. It means this, this is above everything else. This is superior. To everything else. Well, that is who Jesus Christ is, and that is the place Jesus Christ is supposed to have. And so what about Jesus Christ? Well, let's look at it. Colossians chapter 1, in verse 13, uh, the Word of God is talking about uh, uh, Jesus, and it said in verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father, so forth. And then it says in verse 13 this, it says, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. The first thing we see, uh, who Jesus is, let's paint that portrait biblically today. The first thing we see is he is our Redeemer. He is our Redeemer. Now, uh, I believe it's very important for us, if we are going to understand this, for me to define terms as we go through. Because, you know, if I was to say to you, well, Jesus is our Redeemer, you might say, well, that sounds great. And you might walk away and you think, what's a Redeemer? I just don't get that. You know, you might say, oh, everybody knows that. No, not everybody knows that. We don't get the idea of redemption. So we need to define that, don't we, to get a proper portrait of our Savior. He is our Redeemer. You notice in verse 13 it says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness? God has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. That's Jesus. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. The word redemption means to deliver, to deliver by paying a price. All right? It comes from the root, which means to buy out of the market. 
It'd be like you walking through the, the streets of Jerusalem and you see all the different vendors there and the different uh, people who have shops and vegetable stands and, and fruit stands. And you see something, you say, you know what, I want to buy that. And you would do it and you'd pay the price and you now have redeemed that thing out of the market. Well, biblically speaking, God is in the business of delivering us out of the slave market of sin. Out of the slave market of sin. And um, uh, uh, this slave market of sin, you notice it says out of the power, out from the power of darkness. That is under the control of the devil. This world is under the control of Satan. You know, it's amazing to me. Isn't it just like the devil? What are people... Do you ever hear anybody today except Bible-believing Christians blaming the devil for the problems of the world? Who are they blaming today? They're blaming God for the problems of the world. Don't you find that fascinating? Why doesn't God do something? Why doesn't God do... Why does God allow this? Why? And they're blaming God for the problems. Folks, listen, God is... What God did was he gave man the ability to choose. Man is making the choices, and he's making, by and large, all the wrong choices. And that's why the world is the way it is. The perversion, the corruptness, the killing, the murdering, the, the abuse both physical and sexual and every other way, mental and, and all the other things that go along with it. God's not doing that. Man is choosing that. Why? Because he's under the dominion of Satan and Satan tempts him and Satan wants to encourage people to do wicked things. As a matter of fact, the devil is called the wicked one in the Bible. Now, let me make an important point here. When you buy something out of the market, that thing is no longer for sale. Right? And the, that points to the fact that once we trust Jesus Christ the Savior, see, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ the Savior, He buys us, He buys you out of the slave market of sin. He frees you from that slave market. And now, guess what? you're no longer for sale because you belong to him. You might say, well, what if he puts us on eBay? Well, he's not going to do that. There's not a verse in the Bible that says that, right? No, once he buys us, we have been bought with a price. That's a done deal. And once we are his, the Bible says we are his forever. Uh, Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. That means we're not for sale. He bought us. He bought us. Now, the question is, well, how did he buy us? Did he buy us with the dollar? Did he buy us with the euro? Did he buy us with the yen? Okay, did he buy us with the ruble? With the rupee? What did he buy us with? Those are all um, currencies. Hold your place here and let me show this to you. Turn with me over to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Jesus bought us, but he bought us with something that was absolutely phenomenal. According to 1 Peter chapter 1, Jesus bought us out of the slave market of sin into his own family by his very own blood. By his blood is how he bought us. 1 Peter 1.18, it says, For as much as ye know that you were not redeemed, there's that word again, redemption, redeemed, to buy, to deliver by paying a price. For as much as ye know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation or manner of life received by tradition from your fathers, but instead of, you, you weren't redeemed that way, because that, by the way, you can't be redeemed by that. But how can we be redeemed? Verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot. Also, if you're in 1 Peter, go a little bit to your left, and I want you to go with me over to Hebrews chapter 9, the book of Hebrews chapter 9. Another aspect or another uh, picture, explanation of our redemption. Hebrews chapter 9. See, Paul is writing to the Hebrew believers in Hebrews chapter 9. Now, these are Jewish people who understood the Old Testament sacrifices. 
These are Jewish people with, that's what they've grown up with. That's what they're accustomed to. And yet he's writing to them and explaining or reminding them once again that because now they had accepted Jesus as their Messiah, he's saying, hey, don't forget what he's done for you because that'll keep you on track as a believer. And it says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12, neither by the blood of goats and calves. Well, that was their sacrificial system, right? Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered in once into the holy place, watch this, having obtained eternal redemption for us. When Jesus redeemed us by his blood, when he bought us by his blood, by paying for our sins, he obtained eternal redemption for us. It's a once and for all redemption. It goes on forever. So it can never be broken and it never has to be done again. You notice it says he entered in once. Now let's go back to Colossians chapter 1. And you notice in our text here it says God has delivered us from the power or the authority of darkness to the kingdom of his son. You see the Lord always provides what the world cannot Man cannot provide any kind of salvation for himself. We try to provide that. It's natural for man to think, well, you know what? I'm going to try to behave myself to go to heaven. Hey, it's good to behave yourself. We don't want a, a bunch of loonies roaming the streets, okay? But behaving yourself will not take care of your sin problem, nor would it take care of my sin problem. You know, nowhere in the Bible does it say good works will take care of your sin. Nowhere does it say that. What we need is we need a death payment for our sins. And the beauty of what Jesus did, being our Redeemer, is he made that death payment. And then when he made that death payment, God the Father accepted the payment he made, that blood payment. And Jesus shed his blood and now has paid for all of our sins by his shed blood and rose from the grave to prove it was done. He paid the price. What's he asking us to do? Simply put our faith in him that he made that payment for us. And when you do, he gives you everlasting life. God has delivered us from the power or the authority of darkness to the kingdom of his dear son. See, the Lord always provides what the world cannot. What does the world try to do to take care of its problem? You know, there are a lot of miserable people, a lot of empty people walking around this world. So what do they do? They try drugs. Well, this will ease the pain. This will help me. So they try drugs. No, that just numbs you. It just makes you feel a certain way for a while, okay? They'll try alcohol. They'll try money. They'll try fame. They'll try materialism. They'll try sexual perversion. Interestingly enough, man also tries religion. And you know what they find? Every one of those things you come up empty. Every one of those things you say, this does not satisfy. This is not taking care of it. Jesus Christ. You see, only the Lord Jesus Christ can deliver a man. Sing, sin brings with it the chains of bondage, but only Jesus can break the bondage of our sins. And when you believe or you trust in Jesus Christ as Savior, this whole transaction takes place. He saves you, he forgives you, and he transfer, transfers you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. The moment you trust Christ. You mean all I have to do is put my faith in Jesus Christ? Yes. You trust in him that he made the payment for all your sin. You believe in him that all of your sin was paid for on the cross and that he came back from the dead and that he is the only way to heaven. And when you believe, when you put your faith in him and him alone... To get you to heaven, he saves you forever that moment. All your sin is taken away. He gives you everlasting life and he delivers you. He delivers you from that darkness into, the, in, into his kingdom. This word translated, you notice in verse, um, in verse 13 it says, who have delivered us from the, tra from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. This means to remove or to transfer. 
The Lord has taken us out of the rule of Satan and has transferred us into his own kingdom. Listen, saint, once you've trusted Christ as Savior, you are a child of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Can I tell you this? We, we are royalty once we've trusted Christ the Savior. Now, now don't, don't get all puffed up about it because it has nothing to do with our merits. It has everything to do with what Christ has done for us in grace. And you notice there in verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood. See, the blood payment had to be made. Look at this next one. Even the forgiveness of of sins. That word forgiveness, interesting word, it means to send away or to release. Now look up here. Let me, let me illustrate this. Let my left hand represent you and me, and we're going to let this wallet represent our sin. Here we are, you and me. Guess what? We're all sinners, including me. We're all sinners. God loves us. He hates our sin. The Bible says this, to go to heaven, all of our sin has to be gone. There's a problem, though. God says we are sinners. See, sin separates us from God. Heaven's a perfect place. You have to be perfect to get into heaven. Who is? Nobody in themselves is perfect. See, you can't get to heaven by your good works. God says our sin has to be paid for, and the only payment for sin, according to the Bible, is death. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. Friend, listen. God says there's only one payment that'll pay for sin and it's death you might say well wait i'm 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 trying to earn my way to heaven i'm trying to work my way to heaven i'm trying to behave myself be a good person again that's fine but that won't take away the sin death is the only thing a death payment has to be made now if we do it we'll spend forever separated from god in hell Okay? Here's the beauty of what the Bible teaches. And you may have never heard this before. God loves us, hates our sin, because there's nothing we could do to save ourselves. There's nothing we could do to get rid of the sin on our own. Here's what God did for us. Because He loves us so much, hates our sin, He sent His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into the world. You notice He is sinless. God in the flesh. And watch now. When Jesus died on the cross... All the sin we've done or ever will do wrong, he took it upon himself and he shed his blood as the payment for that sin. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. Jesus shed his blood so that we could have forgiveness. He was buried, he died, was buried. Three days later, he came back from the dead and he says this, if you will believe, if you'll put your faith in him, that he made that payment for you, the moment you do, he forgives you of all your sin. He sends your sins away. Imagine that. Listen, no matter what you've ever done or what you'll ever do, if you will put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior, he will forgive you of all your sin, past, present, and future. Why? Because he paid the price 2,000 years ago. All he's asking you to do is put your faith in him that he did that for you. And if you will do that, he will give you that moment, everlasting life. Everlasting? Are, are you serious? You mean to say if I just put my faith in Christ, I'll go to heaven when I die? That's exactly what I'm saying. Because that's what the Bible says. Well, what if I sin after that? Hey, I hate to say it, you will sin after that. We all sin after we've trusted Christ. And that's not a good thing. It's a bad thing. The good thing, though, is that that sin was paid for 2,000 years ago. See, when Jesus died for our sins, how many of our sins were in the future? All of them. Why? We hadn't been born yet. But when you trust in Christ, the payment is good on your behalf and God gives you everlasting life. You might say, you, you spent a lot of time on that. Yes, dear friend, because you, you know why? It's a difference between heaven and hell for you and me. You need to understand it. Let's go back to our text. Secondly, who is Jesus? Verse 15. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. All right. Who is Jesus? Verse 15. He is God himself. He is God 
himself. He is not a God. By the way, he's not Michael the archangel. The cults, such as the Jehovah's Witnesses, believe he's, he's a God, all right, but not God himself. Listen, that is a counterfeit Jesus. Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible, is God himself who took on flesh. All right? You notice it says, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Now, what does that mean? He's the image of God. We get our word icon from it, actually. It's the Greek word icon or icon, and it means that he is the perfect expression of God himself. In other words, Jesus Christ is God And can I tell you this? He is what God looks like in the flesh. It says in um, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty of God on high. There in verse 3 it says the express image. That means the exact representation. The exact representation. This is who Jesus is and was. And then in Hebrews verse 1, chapter 1 verse 8 it says, but unto the Son he saith, thy throne O God is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Who is Jesus? Jesus is God. Listen, co-equal with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. Now, you know why I think most of you have put this together in your head already, but do you know why none of the cults believe in the Trinity? Because they don't believe Jesus is God. How can you have a triune God if one of the parts is missing? If one of the, the, the person, uh, persons of God is, is missing? No, God is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three persons in one. You might say, that kind of fries my brain. Yeah, because he's God, and we're trying to understand the nature of God. And folks, listen, there are some things that are beyond our understanding. Hate to tell you that, but there are some things beyond your understanding. Hate to tell you that. People today, you know, here's the mindset. We are so proud today. Here's our mindset. If I don't understand it, it's not true. La di da. Who do we think we are? Do you know how much stuff must not be true? Right? Isn't there a lot of stuff you don't understand? I don't understand higher math, but I know it's true. Why? Well, because it works out and because God created it. By the way, did you know that God created math? Yes, He did. He did. That's why it works, by the way. If man created it, it wouldn't work. Look with me to John chapter 14. I love this passage. You've got to see this. John chapter 14. Jesus is God himself. John chapter 14. Here is Jesus. This is before he died. And he's talking to his disciples and he says, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die and I'm going to go away, but I'm going to come back and receive you unto myself. So he's having this conversation with them. And then it says in John 14, 8, Philip saith unto him, Lord, talking to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father. And it sufficeth us. That'll be good enough. Jesus saith unto him, have I been so long time with you And yet hast thou not known me, Philip? Watch this. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou, show us the Father? Could anything be clearer than that? Jesus is co-equal with the Father. Jesus is God. He said to Philip, listen, I've been all this time with you. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now, if that's not a claim to deity, I don't know what is. Let's go back to Colossians. What's the next thing we see about the Lord Jesus Christ? We see that he is our redeemer. We see that he is God himself. Number three, it says he's the firstborn of every creature. 
Now people hear that say, ah, I gotcha. I gotcha. He's the firstborn. If he's the firstborn, he can't be God. Because he's the firstborn, that means there's somebody before him. Well, you know, if, you, if we would just pay attention to the text and really study it through, it becomes very clear what God is talking about here. When, when the Bible talks about Jesus being the firstborn of every creature, by the way, it's literally the firstborn, firstborn over all creation, it is answered in the context. And by the way, most Bible questions are answered in the context if we just care to study them through. Look again at your Bible. Look at Colossians 1, verse 15. It says, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created, that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, verse 17. And he is before how many things? All things... And by him all things consist. Many who don't believe in the deity of Christ, they try to say that if Jesus was the firstborn, that means he was a created being. Okay? But firstborn here is a biblical word that refers to his priority of position appointed by the Father. Okay? Okay? It has to mean something other than he wasn't there at the beginning because we have already seen that all things were created by him. How can all things, that's a completely inclusive word, right? How can all things be created by Jesus if he came later? That would be a contradiction. So firstborn has to mean something else. Now this is very important, folks, for you to understand. Not only for yourself, but for people who you talk to about Christ, who are in the cults, who do not believe Jesus is God, to be able to answer this. In verse 15, the firstborn is the heir or the preeminent one, not necessarily the one born first. I'll give you an example. Ishmael and Isaac. There's a prime example. Ishmael was was the actual firstborn of Abraham, but Isaac was the one who received the blessings of the firstborn. See, it's an issue of position. It's a place of honor, is the idea. One commentator said this, this, and I quote, the expression firstborn has at least three different meanings in Scripture. In Luke 2, 7, it is used in a literal sense, where Mary brought her firstborn son. There it means that the Lord Jesus was the first child to whom she gave birth. In Exodus 4.22, on the other hand, it is used in a figurative sense. It says, quote, Israel is my son, even my firstborn, unquote. In that verse, there is no thought of an actual birth having taken place, but the Lord is using this word to describe the distinctive place which the nation of Israel had in his plans and purposes. You notice what he said? The distinctive place that he had, that it had. Finally, in Psalm 89, 27, the word firstborn is used to designate a place of superiority or supremacy of uniqueness. There, God says that he will make David his firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. David... You know where David came in, in his family. David was actually the last born. Son of Jesse, according to the flesh. But God determined to give him a place of unique supremacy, primacy, and sovereignty, unquote. All right? Now, folks, the fact that Christ's preeminence of position is the issue here in Colossians is made clear by the context. Look at verses 17 and 18. He is, what does it say? He is before all things. He is the head of the body, that in all things he might have the preeminence. What are all those three phrases? That's an issue of position, not of origin. It's an issue of position. So if Jesus created all things, 
then he had to be before all things. Well, the only one who was before all things is who? God. So Jesus is God. Because he's called the firstborn, that's a title given of position, not necessarily of origin. Very important. I hope you get that. All right? Let's move on. Number four, and I love this, he is our creator. He is our creator. Have you ever thought of Jesus that way? You might say, wait a minute, I thought God created the world, the universe. Yes. Well, who, who, who created the universe? God. Wait a minute, I thought you said, you're saying Jesus did. Yes, but who's Jesus? God. You notice it says in verse 16, For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, that are, uh, whether they're visible or invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Who did the creating? Jesus did. Therefore, Jesus is who? He has to be God if he created all things. Because he was there, he created all things, therefore he was before all things. Only God is before all things. Only God. This is so important for us to realize. Look at it with me. Verse 17, he is before all things, and by him all things consist. By him all things consist. Who but God himself created all things and therefore is before all things? Only God is. John 1, you know these verses. John 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Later on in that chapter it says, And the Word, God, became flesh and dwelt among us. Referring to Jesus. Jesus is God. You know what the Jehovah's Witnesses say? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. A God. Listen, that's straight from the devil. All the cults try to strip Jesus of his deity. Did you know that? They try to make him less than he is. No, he is God, and he is our creator. Now, you know what's interesting about this? Let me give you a modern day application. And listen, folks, listen. You think about this in terms of the public school system. All right? What do they teach as far as origins in the public school? Evolution. Evolution is the product of rebellion towards God. Now, listen, you might say, well, that's pretty strong language. Can I explain it to you? Can I make it clear to you? I'm not trying to be mean in any way, shape, or form. I'm just telling you the truth, okay? Uh, by the way, if, if you don't believe that evolution is the product of rebellion towards God, listen to the leading propagators of evolution down through the ages. By the way, I'm only going to quote three of them. The first one, famous British evolutionist Sir Arthur Keith said this, Quote, evolution is unprovable, or excuse me, evolution is unproved and unprovable. We believe it because the only alternative is special creation, which is unthinkable. Unquote. Now, how's that for an open mind? See, people don't want truth. They just want what they want. You might say, well, what would cause a person to think that way, okay? Can I give you one suggestion? Second person, Sir Julian Huxley, one of the world's leading evolutionists, said this, and I quote, I suppose the reason we leaped at the origin of the species, that was Darwin's book, was because the idea of God interfered with our sexual mores, unquote. See, God got in the way of what we wanted to do, and so we had to adopt something else to try to do away with God. Thomas Huxley, 
earlier relation to Julian, stated this, and I quote, It is clear that the doctrine of evolution... Now, before I finish it, keep this in mind in light of the public school system and what they're teaching. All right? Thomas Huxley said this, quote, It is clear that the doctrine of evolution is directly antagonistic to that of creation. Evolution, if consistently accepted, makes it impossible to believe the Bible. Unquote. These are the authorities. These are the, uh, the leaders in the past of evolution. And you notice what he said? If you are consistent in believing in evolution, ultimately what's going to happen is you will not believe the Bible because the two cannot coexist. They can't go together. Now, folks, that's the truth of it. See, and so this affects everything. What about world history? You might say, well, I don't... I can believe in evolution and, and, uh, and uh, you know, believe the Bible. No, you really can't. You really can't if you follow it through. What does, what does the, the, the secular society believe about world history? How did we start? Well, they believe we started with the Big Bang. Okay, there was nothing. Now this is it. Here's what they teach. Nothing exploded. Well, that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Nothing exploded. Now I could say as an illustration, okay, so here, here's the air in front of me and there's nothing there, but wait a minute, that breaks down, doesn't it? Because there's air there. Evolution teaches nothing exploded, and now we have everything over billions and billions and billions of years. Friend, you have, you have a lot more faith. You have to have more faith in that than I have to do in the Bible. Because as I look out, it's very evident. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Why? Because there's order, there's structure, there's design, and a design points to a designer. And by the way... <laughs> If that designer, creator, is God, and if Jesus is God, and you reject God, who are you going to reject? Jesus. You'll never be saved, and you'll never go to heaven. And that's exactly where Satan wants you to be, is in that place. Let's move on, back to Colossians chapter 1. He is the sustainer of all Things. You notice it in verse 17, it says, And he is before all things, and by, all, and by him all things consist. Uh, the, the word consists. Uh, sunistano, that's where we get our word sustain. All things created by Jesus Christ are now being sustained or held together by him. Science in years past, I don't know what term they use now, they probably have a big long term that no one understands and gets intimidated by if they look at it. That's how they hide behind these things. But back in the old days, you know what they called it? They called it there's a cosmic glue that holds everything together. We don't know what it is. We haven't figured it out yet, but there's a cosmic glue. And if there wasn't that cosmic glue, everything would explode, like the atom would just explode. All right? Now listen. Cosmic glue? You know what the Bible says? The cosmic glue is a person and his name is Jesus. By him all things are held together. Let's move on. Number six, Jesus is the head of the church. We see that in verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from among the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. See, we are living in a day that everyone is hungry for a hero. Everybody wants a hero, whether it's a sports figure, whether it's this, whether it's that. Someone who is extraordinary, who stands out. Someone to respect because of their skills and talents. Can I say this morning, with total confidence, no one in all of history, can even be compared to our Lord Jesus Christ. He is God. He is the Creator. He is our Redeemer. He is our Savior. He is our Sustainer. He is the head of the church. By Him, all things consist. There's no one 
who can compare with Jesus Christ. What He has done for mankind and continues to do is indescribable and incomparable. He is the head of the church. Isn't it just logical that it says there at the, verse, at the end of verse 18 that in all things He might have the preeminence? The dominant position, first place. Why? Because He's incomparable. That's why. Because He is who He said He is. He, you might say, oh, I don't believe he's a creator. You know, it's very interesting. Read the gospel accounts. He created things when he was here. What about the two times with the loaves and fishes? Do you think that's amazing? I think that's amazing. By the way, wouldn't you have loved to be there? Man, I would have loved to be there and to see that. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is perfect. He is the God-man. He is our Savior. He is our Redeemer. He is our Creator. He is our Sustainer. What He has done for us can never be matched by anyone else, nor will it ever be matched by anyone else. Now, if, if He is all of these things, and He is, then how should it affect our lives. Now listen closely, dear friend, as we're getting towards the end today. Listen closely. If Jesus is all that we have seen He is, the first thing you need to do is you need to trust Him as your personal Savior. He's God who is the Savior. He is the only one who can save you from an eternity in hell to an eternity in heaven. He's the only one. You can't do it. Because your sin has to be paid for. You're either going to accept the payment he made for your sins or you will spend forever suffering in hell to pay for your own. What an awful thought. People say, well, hasn't Jesus already paid for sins? Yes, but the payment he made is not put to your account until you trust him as your Savior. That's what the doctrine of imputation is all about. So have you trusted Christ as your Savior? If you haven't, would you trust him as your Savior Today, would you do that? And for those who have trusted Christ the Savior, you know, what it, you know what? It only makes sense. Once we've trusted Christ, to submit our lives to Him and say, hey, you know what, Lord? <laughs> you know a whole lot more than I do. I mean, you're God. You can do a better job with my life than I can. Now, you don't have to do that to go to heaven. Salvation's a gift. You simply trust Christ the Savior. But I want to urge you today, dear friend, if you're... If you're not sure where you're going when you die, would you today put your faith in Jesus Christ? You're not promising to be religious. You're not promising anything. You're taking God at his promise and saying, you know what? I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. I know I can't save myself. And today I'm putting my faith in Jesus Christ to get me to heaven. It's all we're talking about. And if you'll trust in him, he will give you as a free gift everlasting life. Would you do that? Let's all bow in prayer.